morning guys. Uh, so yesterday we introduced our new chapter on momentum. Uh, momentum was this product uh, between mass and velocity and what it described for the object was a tendency to stay in motion. Uh, things that happen to be very large with a really big mass, if they're already moving, they're going to be really hard to stop. And as well as things that are moving quickly, uh, you need to do a lot to actually bring that one to rest. So uh, just to recap with you here, momentum, uh, we're just going to use uh, P for the symbol. Momentum is a vector, and the vector is actually in the same direction as velocity. So velocity going to the right, if it's in the positive direction, uh, your tendency to stay in motion is in that direction. Uh, it can also be negative for pointing the opposite direction as well. Uh, one thing we're going to be seeing uh, throughout this uh, unit is the fact that momentum is a conserved quantity. Uh, when we say something is conserved in science, we basically say that um, Basically, all the momentum beforehand has to be all the momentum afterwards. Uh, it may be able to transfer between objects. It can pass from one object to the other. Uh, but momentum isn't something that can uh, be created or destroyed. So uh, we're going to see sort of a, a many different styles of this uh, setup. But basically, the physics boils down to uh, we're going to use the sigma notation again. Uh, the sigma just means add up. If you add up all the objects that have momentum coming into the collision or into uh, the problem, this has to equal all the momentum that's coming out of the problem. So uh, the physics is actually as simple as that, although uh, definitely uh, we're going to start off uh, looking more into collisions in this lesson here, and then uh, through the next couple classes here, we're going to start switching over into two-dimensional stuff, uh, having to break down components again, but ultimately we are still saying all the momentum before has to be all the momentum afterwards. Uh, I'm going to introduce to you uh, a concept in our next uh, section, which is on energy later on, uh, but it does relate to this motion part, so I just want to introduce it here. Uh, and that's the notion here of a kinetic energy. Uh, you may remember this from earlier science classes here. Kinetic energy, sometimes they're going to write uh, just KE, uh, or if we just say energy E for general, uh, you may have subscript K for the kinetic part. Uh, kinetic energy is essentially the energy of motion. Uh, so things that move quickly uh, have a lot of kinetic energy, things that are at rest have zero kinetic energy. Uh, basically, it's describing how much energy things have uh, when they move. Uh, energy, just introduced to you, uh, we're going to be using the unit joule, um, and that's uh, the standard unit uh, that we're used for energy. Uh, because kinetic energy here uh, is talking about motion energy, uh, we're going to have our, on our formula sheet here, our EK is actually given by one half, there's always a half as a scaling factor, and then mv squared. So uh, just like with momentum here, if I have a much larger object, uh, having to move a larger object here will carry more kinetic energy. Uh, if the thing moves uh, quicker, again, more kinetic energy here. Uh, one really nice thing about energy uh, in our next chapter here is that energy is actually a scalar. Uh, unlike momentum that has both uh, size and direction, uh, this thing here uh, as a scalar here is only magnitude. So what we're going to find uh, throughout the energy chapter coming up is uh, you can just calculate what's the energy beforehand. Uh, you can just add up the values here. There's no directions. There's no uh, breaking up vectors or anything like that. It's, in that sense here, a lot more simple. Uh, so we're going to see uh, in this lesson here, uh, analyzing a few collision problems, we're going to start off studying the momentum of it, see what we can learn uh, about uh, transferring of this tendency to stay in motion, and then we're going to see uh, whether energy is actually a conserved quantity. Uh, we know energy in general is actually conserved. Uh, we'll do more on this in tomorrow's lesson, uh, but that's talking about the entire universe. Uh, depending on uh, how hard the collision hits, energy may actually change from moving energy to stored energy to heat energy to sound energy. Uh, so although the total amount stays the same, um, we may actually find that the kinetic part actually does change. Uh, now just uh, one other comparison before we step into a problem here. You'll see that there's a lot of similarities between the momentum formula and this kinetic energy formula. They both depend on this uh, mass velocity product here. And in fact, uh, I can just solve it out for you here. Uh, this is actually it's the same as momentum squared divided by 2m. Uh, that's something you can just sort of work through in the math here. If the momentum, the P there is uh, m times v, imagine squaring that one there divided by m. On the top, you're going to get m squared v squared all over 2m. Uh, one of the m's are going to drop out, and this ends up being half mv squared. So if you go on to physics here, one way of thinking about kinetic energy here is it's actually related to the momentum, but it's being scaled down by twice the mass. So 
uh, again, uh, for this lesson here, I just wanted to uh, just rehash with you uh, collision and basically uh, the whole notion of what can we learn uh, when momentum is conserved. So uh, we're going to start off here. A one kilogram car moving at five meter per second hits a two kilogram truck at rest. And yesterday we did a very similar problem here. Um, so they're describing to you uh, the before the collision. So we have a one kilogram car. It was currently moving at five meter per second. That's already the correct SI units, which is awesome. Uh, we're going to collide into a two kilogram truck. So a two kilogram is sitting in front of us here, slightly larger mass, and this one here is at rest. So that is the before picture. Uh, we are going to study sort of like the incoming, the collision, and then the afterwards here. Uh, what we're going to see in this lesson here is they do need to hint at something uh, about what happens afterwards. So uh, just with this information alone, it's not enough. Uh, depending on how the collision happens, maybe the car rebounds off the truck. Maybe they continue going in the same direction. Maybe they stick together. Uh, I do need to be told something about uh, what happens afterwards. So uh, I'm going to give you a few different situations here, like an ABC. Uh, let's say in part A, uh, we're told that the one kilogram, upon hitting the truck, the one kilogram comes to a dead halt. So after the collision here, we have one kilogram. Now the one kilogram is at rest. If you were watching this collision happen, intuitively you'd say, okay, then the two kilogram here has to carry on that motion here. It's going to then have some V final afterwards. Right? So being told that information here, basically first object hits the two kilogram, the first object comes to a uh, stop, and basically we want to calculate uh, what the final velocity is going to be. So in being told that that is the after setup this time, we're going to utilize our uh, conservation law. So P in is equal to P out. All the momentum before has to be all the momentum outwards. Uh, you could uh, just sort of break this down in terms of uh, the different objects. So the momentum of the car plus the momentum of the truck. Uh, this has to equal to the momentum of the car after, or final, plus the momentum of the truck, final. Right? And in fact, usually I just go straight to our formula. We know momentum is equal to m times v. Basically, I'm going to have an m times v product for every object that I have. I'm going to call the car object 1, so m1 v1 plus m2 v2, stating for the truck. Then we have M1, looks like the car is completely intact, it's still one kilogram, uh, but then the V1F may be a little bit different, and the M2 V2F there, right? And again, the physics here is actually just this, all the momentum before has equal all the momentum afterwards, uh, the rest of this, as we'll see, is just gonna be a little bit of math. So uh, the car here is one kilogram, it is five meter per second. The truck here is a two kilogram mass, so it's twice as heavy, but this one here is currently at rest. Uh, if you just work out those numbers there, the first object here started with a uh, five tendency to stay in motion, going to the right. The other one here, because it was at rest, it actually has no momentum, so no real surprise there. This one here has to equal to, the car again is intact at 1.0, and the car, we're told, actually comes to a rest, so now this one here doesn't have any uh, motion. Uh, the truck, as it leaves, is gonna leave with some uh, ending velocity, so V2F there. So just crunching through the numbers here, uh, one times zero, so when the car comes to a stop, it no longer has momentum. Where did the momentum go? Well, the car transferred its momentum over to the truck. Uh, the truck being a slightly heavier object, it's two times the V2F has to carry that five momentum. So the car brought a total tendency going forward, staying in motion of five. Uh, the truck really didn't contribute anything. If the car doesn't take away anything, uh, the truck has to take away five. And as I mentioned, because the truck is overall a little bit heavier, when you divide that two over, we're actually going to find that the V2F actually ends up for the truck being 2.5. So for momentum to be conserved, uh, the truck here is actually going to intuitively go uh, forward, and it's actually going to be going forward at 2.5 meter per second. We're going to see that the speed is actually half of what it was beforehand, because again, a heavier object is slightly harder to speed up, although we're still doing the same physics. Uh, it's the same phi that was conserved uh, to the end. Uh, just, uh, just sort of introducing what we're going to see in the next lesson here is we're going to also think about this in terms of kinetic energy. Uh, so think about Ke. I just gave you the formula here is half mv squared. Let's also think about, well, at first we had two objects. So the car had a m1 v1 squared plus one half m2 v2 squared, so that's referring to the truck. And let's compare it to 
the 1 half m1 b1 squared for the car afterwards, b1 final, uh, plus the 1 half m2 v2 final. Again, what we're tempted to say here is we're tempted to say, oh, this is energy. Energy is equal. But remember, I'm specifically looking at the kinetic type of energy, so the moving type of energy. So what we're going to do is we're just going to crunch through the numbers here, and we're going to test whether this is actually equal or not. Yes, I know energy should be conserved overall. Again, more on this in tomorrow's lesson. Uh, but let's just plug our way through, and let's see what we get. So for our car here, we have a 1 half. The car is 1 kilogram here. I kept the numbers fairly simple. The speed was 5 squared. Uh, for the other object here, we have a 1 half. Uh, truck is 2 kilogram here. Uh, not only did the truck, when it was at rest, it has no momentum. Well, since kinetic energy is moving energy, it also will end up canceling out here. It's going to have no moving energy. So, uh, 0 joules of moving energy here. On the other side here, we have 5 squared of 25 divided by uh, 2. So that's 12.5 uh, moving energy. All right. So, let's figure out what happens afterwards. After the collision here, we have, again, our 1 half. Our 1 kilogram was intact. The car came to a halt. So this was at 0. Now the car actually has no uh, moving energy. What about the truck? Now we had to actually do uh, the momentum conservation to actually find this number. But now that we have the number here, let's just plug our way through. We're a 2 kilogram truck here. If we happen to be leaving at 2.5 meter per second, uh, don't forget that square there. 2.5 squared times 2 divided by 2 basically cancels out here. We're going to get 6.25. Right. Um, so basically what we found here is uh, before the collision, uh, we actually had 12.5 units of moving energy. Right. So this is the initial, but I want to specify here, it's the kinetic type of energy. Right. This is how much the car is bringing into the collision. We would assume energy in general is conserved, so uh, we'll see this uh, more uh, tomorrow. Basically, E in should equal to E out. That is true, but this is E in general. It could be kinetic type, potential type, sound type, whatever. So in this case here, initially, it looks like uh, the only energy source is just kinetic energy here. So we're going to start off with an EK in. We're going to try to match up. Well, the EK going out actually is carried by uh, the truck. But right now here, wait a second, the 12.5 here is not equal to 6.25. What's going on? Well, remember, kinetic is just one type of energy here. Uh, although we do have energy conserved in general, right? so this is looking at all forms of energy altogether. Well, when this collision happens, I expect to hear a very loud sound. So some is loss of sound energy. Maybe there's going to be some sparks here. So it's going to be loss of heat energy, as light energy here, as a whole bunch of energies. If you add up all those little bits here, yes, in total it should amount to 12.5. But at least in terms of moving energy-wise, uh, we have actually lost energy. So uh, that's what uh, the numbers say. Um, you can write down in words for yourself here. Uh, some energy, some energy is converted, or we just say in general here, it's lost to the surroundings. Um, and that's uh, in the form of uh, the sound, the heat, the light. Uh, those are also uh, energy forms here, but um, basically what's left over as moving energy here is actually a little bit less. Right? So in the next uh, two sort of setups here, we're actually going to keep the initial the same, so the same sort of car colliding with the truck. Remember, we were told that the car came to an immediate halt. What if the car actually did something different? Uh, what we're going to do again is we're going to study the momentum aspect of it, we're going to deal with conservation, and then we're going to see whether moving energy is conserved uh, in the other two uh, styles of uh, collisions. So uh, let me just uh, sketch for you the second uh, situation here. Uh, let me just uh, Go over some of the numbers again. Uh, one kilogram, it was going at five meter per second. Uh, the truck here is two kilograms. Remember this one here is at rest. Totally, we could have had a collision that the truck was also moving. Uh, that one would just amount to some, um, it would have to carry some momentum as well. If it was going right, it's positive. If it's going left, it's going to be negative. Uh, after the collision this time, again, I'm being told a little bit here. After the collision, I want to introduce, uh, what if this collision here is uh, inelastic? So what if uh, they somehow end up getting mangled together and they just sort of smush together and they're sort of stuck? So in that case there, uh, again, intuitively, the question is naturally going to be, well, what final velocity do they leave at? Now, I, if I'm watching this collision happen, uh, our brains naturally are used to momentum being conserved. 
if this object here had some tendency to stay to the right, even after colliding with something heavier, sure, it's going to be a much larger mass, it may not travel as quickly, but I still imagine that there could be some tendency to go to the right as well. So, again, let's just rehash here. The, uh, the science is simple. Pn is equal to Pl. All the momentum before has to equal all the momentum afterwards. I'm just going to go straight to my m times v. So, my first object here, I have an m1 v1. For my truck, I have an m2 v2. This time, because I only have one object afterwards, I just have one combined mass, although you could say m3 v3, uh, if assuming that there's no parts that are lost, you can think about this is actually m1 plus m2, right? It's going to be 3 kilograms uh, multiplied by the final velocity that they leave at. So let's just try it out again here. We have a 1 kilogram object. It's traveling at 5 meter per second. The truck here was at rest, so it has no momentum. Uh, later on, we are a 3 kilogram mass in total. What final velocity does this 3 kilogram have to leave at, uh, given that this collision here, because it sticks together, we're going to use this term. Uh, it's called inelastic. It's a perfectly inelastic collision when it sticks together. So just like uh, we saw in the uh, problem just above here, so we have five tendencies to stay in motion, kilogram meter per second. The uh, truck here actually has no momentum here. Now that suddenly I'm a heavier object, it's going to be 3 times v. Uh, we're going to solve our way for velocity here. So 5 divided by 3 here. Uh, this one here gives you 2 or 3 sig figs, so 1.7. Notice that this one here is a positive number, so that uh, sort of uh, supports what we had guessed. Well, this one here continues to speed up moving forwards, and you see that, again, the speed is not as quick as it was before. You can even compare it to situation A. Situation A here, when the car came to immediately halt, basically all the momentum was transferred to the truck. That's as fast as the truck is going to move. The truck is going 2.5. Uh, now that we're actually a heavier mass, we can't even get the 2.5. We're actually only going forwards 1.7. Again, let's just think in terms of energy here. So usually I try to do momentum first, see what we can find. Usually we can find one unknown, be it an unknown mass or unknown velocity. Uh, but just in terms of moving energy here, uh, we already dealt with the momentum part of it. Uh, let's just deal with the energy side. And for the time being, we're just looking at kinetic energy. So again, we're going to go half. Uh, m1 v1 squared plus 1 half m2 v2 squared. Again, while we're tempted to say equal, uh, we want to test whether that's true or not. Um, I guess in this collision here, well, because this collision here will probably be really loud and uh, it'll lose some energy due to heat, chances are this is not going to be equal. So uh, don't bank on it being equal, but the whole point of doing this here is to test whether uh, it will be equal or not. So let's just uh, plug our way through here. So the car, basically nothing has changed. So we were one kilogram, uh, the velocity was a five squared. The second object here, two kilogram here, but we were at rest, so just like I expected, no momentum. Afterwards, we are a three kilogram object, happening to go at 1.7. If you still have the whole number in your calculator, just keep it in there. Take the square of that number there, uh, multiply it by three, divide by two. This gives me here how much moving energy do I have afterwards when they slide off is actually 4.2. How much did they have to begin with here? Well, the object at rest here had none. And in the other case here, we have 5 squared divided by 2 here. We had that same 12.5 from earlier. Right? And again, we have this idea, oh no, uh, kinetic energy is actually not conserved. This part here is the moving type of energy. Part of it got translated into kinetic energy final. But because energy can be converted in multiple forms, it can be converted into potential energy, it can be converted to a whole host of different energies. Yes, the 12.5 has to stay the same somehow, uh, but at least in terms of the moving energy, no. Uh, we actually have very little that's left over uh, causing this uh, mass to actually continue moving forwards. Uh, there's one other common thing that can happen in this collision, so let's deal with that situation. Um, we're going to go our one kilogram object. I'm just keeping our starting situation the same, so you have a little bit more familiarity with it here. Uh, this is going to collide with a 2 kilogram object here. The 2 kilogram truck is at rest. And this time, what I'm told, uh, probably naturally, well, the car had come to a stop in A. They stuck together in B here. What if the car actually rebounds backwards? So let's give the car here. Um, so same 1 kilogram car. It stays intact. Uh, let's say it rebounds backwards at 3 meter per second. And the question here is, what happens to the truck? Right, the truck is a 2 kilogram object here. We can use the same physics, right? So we're going to go P in. All the momentum before the collision has to be all the momentum going out. 
for every momentum uh, object, I'm going to have an m times v product. So I'm going to have a m1 v1 for the car and m2 v2 for the truck. This has to equal an m1 v1 final and an m2 v2 final. Right. Let's just plug our way through and see what numbers we have here. We have a 1. It's going at 5 meter per second. The other object here is 2 kilogram here. This is at rest, so I had no moving energy at all. Momentum is going to be conserved, so they didn't have the same problem as our kinetic energy. In this case here, our one kilogram object actually rebounds backwards. So even though it's clear in the picture here, remember velocity here is a vector. To indicate uh, that this direction here is actually backwards, I'm actually going to introduce a negative there. Just like back in our first chapter here, we saw us just randomly, oh, let's add a negative or just take away a negative here. Uh, basically, um, it was just to indicate direction for us. Uh, so let's put in that negative there and let's figure out for the two kilogram truck here as it leaves, what is its final velocity? Great, we have one equation with one unknown, so we can solve our way through. At first, the total tendency in motion is just as five. We've been seeing the other, uh, other two questions here. The truck that's at rest has no momentum. Notice this time, if I go one times negative three, the car actually leaves with a negative three. So upon after the collision and actually bouncing backwards, it actually is going to uh, have some negative momentum. It's actually a momentum tendency to stay in the reverse direction. Now the question again in general is, well, what total momentum does a truck have to have even after the car leaves with an extra three going to the left that we had in total a five going to the right? Uh, so you can work on numerically here. Uh, we have a five there. Well, the total momentum would need to be something like an eight, right? Because if this one here at eight, well, why, why does it suddenly have more momentum? Well, if the truck can continue going forwards with a tendency of eight momentum, eight minus the three that it takes away from the car, in total we have five, and five is then for equal to f uh, five. Remember, momentum is always a product between mass and velocity, so the eight by itself doesn't necessarily give me the, uh, the velocity. Let's just work our way through the math here. I know uh, the two times V2F here, I'm just gonna add the plus three over. So two times V2F here has to actually give you an eight, and this actually leaves you with, the truck actually leaves with a four uh, meter per second, right? And if you just sort of compare uh, the sizes of the velocity so far here, uh, the first time the truck was leaving off just at 2.5, if the car just came to a uh, stop, if it actually stuck together, it's a much heavier mass here. It couldn't really speed forwards. But this, in this case here, because it actually rebounds, because it actually gains some negative momentum, the truck gets even more momentum than the five that it had uh, to begin with to make sure it's actually conserved five and five. And therefore, the truck actually ends up leaving at four meter per second. Right? So uh, with this momentum uh, conservation, we just did three problems here. It was the same physics. Basically, we're saying all the momentum in has to equal to all the momentum out. It doesn't always have to be two objects in, two objects out. So let me just leave you with this problem here. Um, just a standard uh, collision style problem. Uh, let's just do it by a picture here. Let's start off here with a uh, 200 kilogram mass. Uh, let's say it's going at 14 meter per second. So that's about um, 50 kilometers per hour or so. Uh, it's gonna collide with a 400 kilogram object. And this object here is going to have unknown velocity. I don't know how fast it's going. Uh, and they're unfortunately going to actually collide with one other mass here. Uh, let's say it's an 800 kilogram object, and this object here is at rest. Right? So still leaving in some familiarity for you here, so you can sort of match it up with the earlier question here. Uh, basically, these collisions, it's totally possible that the first two could collide first, uh, but just for simplicity's sake here, let's imagine by the time this first car here has actually caught up to the second car, the second car has actually caught up to the third car, and that collision hap actually happens all at once. So that's the before. We would naturally have an assumption here, the 400 kilogram has to be traveling at a speed less than 14. That's the only way for the 200 kilogram to actually uh, catch up to it. Uh, I need to be told something about the after. So let's uh, be told here, for the after part here, the 200 and the 400 actually stick together. Again, remember that word there was inelastic as a collision, right? Kinetic energy is not conserved there. Um, so we have a 200 and a 400. We're told this one here actually travels backwards, just like in an earlier question. Let's go backwards at two meter per second. The 800 kilogram here that was initially not moving, right? Some of the momentum got transferred. I know the total momentum has to be conserved for the whole collision, but remember it could be passed between objects. Let's say the 800 continues forwards at eight meter per second. Uh, I'm just gonna sort of sketch this out for you here and let you solve your way through. The physics that we're gonna always come back to in this chapter is a simple P in is equal to P out. 
for every object uh, that we have, they could potentially have momentum. So what you're going to do is you're going to do a m1 v1 for the 200 kilogram, and m2 v2, so your v2 is actually your unknown this time, hopefully we're going to have all the other numbers, and m3 v3, uh, I'm going to still write that like that, but we know that because m3 is actually at rest, we know this is zero, that one there actually contributes no momentum. Afterwards, uh oh, only two of the objects get together, that's fine. Let's make it m1 plus m2. They're going to travel off at some velocity. Let's say v, uh, v total final, if you like. And then plus a m3 v3 final. And just be careful here. You do have basically all the numbers here. Again, because this 2 here is in the backward direction, make sure you actually put in for this velocity here. Uh, let's just, so v, maybe 1, 2 final. Uh, this velocity here is actually going to be a negative 2. Okay, so just like we did in the earlier question. So you should have basically all the numbers here, and you should be able to solve your way for the velocity. Uh, and basically, based on our momentum conservation, we can actually predict how quickly that uh, middle mass is actually moving. All right? So uh, work your way through the worksheet and just practice uh, this style of question here. We'll pick it up from here tomorrow. Thanks, guys.